there are hundreds of thousands of known living things in the world. If you've ever traveled through a swamp or marsh, you may have discovered many different kinds of plants, as well as birds and other animals. And if you've ever taken a walk in a forest, you may have seen different kinds of living things, such as squirrels, turkeys, and insects. If you take a closer look, you may notice that there are hundreds of different types of trees, flowers, and ferns, to name just a few. Almost every place you go on Earth, you see different types of living things. How are living things placed into groups? Why is it important to group living things? And what are some of these groups? During the next few minutes, we're going to explore these questions and others as we discuss the classification of living things. You decide. How would you group these things? You could group them by the job they perform. The pens, pencils, and markers could be placed in a group of things that write. Another group can be made of the paper, post-it notes, and notebook, which are things that are written on. Another way things can be grouped is based on color. Why is it useful to place objects in groups? By grouping things, it makes things easier to find. For example, could you imagine how hard it would be to find things in this lumber yard if similar boards were not grouped together? Scientists group living things to make them easier to study and to show relationships. Let's take a closer look at the process by which living things are grouped in science. Could you imagine having to group over two million kinds of living things found on Earth? This is exactly the task scientists have had to face over time. Classification is the process of grouping things based on their similarities. Scientists dating back to the Greek philosopher Aristotle attempted to classify living things. Aristotle classified animals based primarily on the environment in which they lived, whether it be in the air, the land, or in the water. As time went on and the number of living things discovered increased, scientists developed new ways of classifying organisms using characteristics. In the 1750s, a Swedish scientist named Carolus Linnaeus developed the basis for the modern system of classification. With the help of other scientists before him, Linnaeus organized plants and animals so they could be easily identified based on the similarities in their body structure. Scientists since Linnaeus improved on this classification system to create the one we use today. Let's take a closer look at this system. Today's classification system uses two names for each different kind of living thing. These two names are called an organism's scientific name. In this two-name process, scientists use Latin words, which may sound strange to you. For example, the scientific name for a house cat is Felis domesticus. Felis is a general category for other cat-like animals, whereas domesticus means of the house. The mountain lion, another cat-like animal, has the name Felis concolor. The first word identifies a broad group called a genus, and the second word identifies the species. This way of naming things makes it clear what specific living thing is being studied. Scientists use Latin names because they're less confusing. For example, the common blue jay is also called the blue coat, the corn thief, and the nest robber. But it has just one scientific name, Cyanocida cristata.
A species is a group of similar living things that produce the same kind of offspring. For example, this white pine tree, commonly found in northern climates, has the genus name Pinus and the species name Strobus. While there are other pine trees in the genus Pinus, the species Strobus can only reproduce with others of the same species to produce Pinus Strobus, or white pine offspring. How do scientists classify living things? This can actually be a very complicated process. One of the most common characteristics scientists use to classify living things is based on their physical appearance. This could be the outward appearance, such as body shape or leaf shape, or it could be based on internal structures, such as the skeleton. In cases where two different kinds of living things look alike, scientists may have to look at other characteristics, such as their early stages of development, or take a closer look at their genetic information from body cells, or they may choose a classification based on behavior. Scientists who spend the majority of their time classifying living things are called taxonomists. You decide. If you were to place all living things into two big groups, what would they be? The most obvious choice would be plants and animals. Plants and animals are two of the six broad categories called kingdoms into which living things are grouped. The six kingdoms include two different bacteria kingdoms, the kingdom containing protists, the fungi kingdom, plants, and animals. Each of these kingdoms has categories within it, right down to the genus and species level. Have you ever had an infection on your skin? Chances are the infection was caused by tiny living things called bacteria that cannot be seen by the naked eye. It's necessary to use a microscope to see these one-celled living things. Bacteria do not contain a structure called a nucleus in their cell. Most bacteria need to eat other things to survive or they make their food from the sun's energy. Most common bacteria belong to the kingdom called eubacteria. Some bacteria fall into the kingdom called archaebacteria. These bacteria tend to live in harsh environments, such as in hot springs and geysers, deep in marsh mud, in salt pools or lakes, and deep in the ocean in volcanic areas called hydrothermal vents. Many of these bacteria are able to create the energy they need to survive from chemicals they obtain from the environment in which they live. What do this paramecium, this phytoplankton, and this kelp all have in common? They're all in the kingdom Protista. Protists are different from bacteria in that they have a nucleus in their cell. Most protists, like paramecium, are made up of one cell. But others, such as this algae, which is often called seaweed, have many cells. Some protists need to eat other living things for energy, whereas other protists, such as algae, are able to produce their food from the sun's energy. Chances are, You've probably eaten something found in the next kingdom we'll discuss, fungi. Mushrooms you buy in the store are members of the fungi kingdom. Most fungi contain many cells and are attached to the ground or to something else. This fungus is attached to a dead tree. Fungi cannot make their own food the way plants can, 
but instead get their nourishment from once living things. Plants are found just about everywhere on the planet. In fact, there are over 255,000 different kinds of plants on Earth, and scientists are still discovering new ones all the time. Plants are made up of many cells and make their own food from the sun's energy in a process called photosynthesis. The plant kingdom contains many different large categories of plants, including mosses, which are low-growing plants living in moist areas. Ferns are plants that reproduce by spores. Conifers are trees and shrubs that reproduce from seeds, which are found in cones. Conifers are often called evergreens because they keep their leaves throughout the winter. Flowering plants reproduce from seeds that develop within flowers. Most things we eat come from flowering plants. If you have a pet, or even a little brother or sister, they're part of the animal kingdom. The animal kingdom is the largest kingdom. Animals are made of cells and get food from their environment. One simple way to categorize animals is based on whether or not they have a backbone. Animals that do not have a backbone are called invertebrates. Insects, crayfish, starfish, and clams are examples of invertebrates. Many animals, such as people, do have backbones and are called vertebrates. Fish, birds, amphibians, such as frogs, reptiles, such as alligators, and mammals, such as cows, are all vertebrates. During the past few minutes, we've explored the importance and need for classifying living things. We explored how the scientific classification system has two names for each kind of living thing. And we discussed how taxonomists use characteristics such as outward appearance, early stages of development, behavior, and genetic information to classify living things. We took a brief look at some of the features of living things in the six major kingdoms, including eubacteria and archaebacteria, as well as protists, fungi, plants, and animals. So the next time you see an insect or see an animal you're not familiar with, think about how it might be classified. You just might think about living things a little differently. Fill in the correct word to complete the sentence. Good luck and let's get started. Number one. Living things are easier to if they're grouped. Number two, a scientific name includes names. Number three, scientists classify living things based on many Number four, there are six major and number five, humans are in the kingdom. <laughs> 